fuck it. We'll do it BC. live. <laughs> We're doing Dude, it cheers. cheers. What are you, are you drinking that Malice and Mistletoe shit or something? No, else? man. This is uh, this is Scotch. Right. So, it's, uh, here I've got the bottle. Jura oh, Sevenwood. Seven wood. Interesting. Is it good? It's really good. I got it for a Christmas gift uh, from a colleague, and it's it's really really good. Let me see that bottle again. How much have you had oh, since God. Christmas? <laughs> that's not bad no no this are you is like this is like the third one or something if that was me it'd be down near the bottom probably <laughs> are you working from home right now are you telecommuting or are you no man i have to go in Same. yeah so um okay i'm, I'm the manager you... of a bank and so uh we're open uh and we're helping customers so mm. i got but it's crazy dude i'm like you know without getting too into the weeds or, or talking too much about what's you know, internal and, and violating HIPAA and all that. I mean, we've had to deal with a lot of quarantine type stuff um, that has mm -hmm. really, really challenged us. Same. So, yep. Hey, this is fucking Nate Davis, by the way. <laughs> Nate is a screenwriter, Hello. producer on our film Cactus Jack, which, if you stick around, you can see a trailer at the end of this. Go to www.cactusjackfilm.com, see information on pre-ordering the virtual premiere we're going to have and all that shit, blah, 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 blah. It releases in like 10 fucking days. Nate, we just did your show. Nate has a show called Re-Entry. You want to tell people what that's about? Yeah, so uh, Re-Entry is a screenwriting uh, show on YouTube. Um, I was kind of in the whole screenwriting game back in 2012 to 2014. I had a manager. I had a pretty big option, some things in development. Um, and everything just got kind of torpedoed for various reasons. I got super frustrated by the business, um, got annoyed by Hollywood in general and walked away, I'll drink to did that. a graphic novel, wrote a bunch of short stories and just kind of lived life. Um, but I decided I wanted to get back into it last year. I think 2020 just kind of, um, set my priorities straight and made me realize I still really want to make movies. So I, uh, I started a series documenting myself writing a brand new script, uh, interviewing people along the way who uh, really know their shit when it comes to screenwriting, uh, just on every step of the process. And it's been pretty cool. So uh, we just did episode 18. He's had amazing guests, dudes like Malcolm Spellman, who's like the showrunner on Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming out on fucking Disney+. Plus. Um, he worked on Empire. Malcolm's a beast. He's awesome. Who else? You've had... The Parlo Panidis brothers who have Blood of yeah, Zeus Parlo on Panini Netflix. The guys yeah. who wrote um, Immortals. That I mean, you've been star discussing. fucking. We're slumming it here with you. <laughs> like, Last week was uh, Christy Lowry, who, um, so she's got a, she's shows. the executive story editor on um, FBI, which is coming out, uh, or yeah, it's, it's about to come out uh, on CBS. And uh, yeah, dude, it's been it's been super cool. Um, I've been really grateful for everybody's time, and I've been learning something from every single episode. Um, and hopefully, other people are too. Totally. Now, we do a couple versions of this show. There's just hard out, which is just fucking mayhem for sixty minutes, ticking time bomb. We talk about anything, which this can be. We also do a version called My Favorite Movie, where we ask someone what their all time favorite movie is, or at least you know, help them narrow down picking up one of the more interesting picks. If they have like three, they can't pick you like us. Cause that's a running joke of this whole thing. Can't fucking pick a favorite movie. No way. Like I, I, but just I thought think it'd be crazy. interesting if by the end of this episode, we, we corner you into picking something. Let's talk about your favorite movies. Like well, what, what would be in well, the running? I mean, what I can tell you is that, so you did, um, when you were doing this, I mean, one of the ones that's definitely at the top is just Lord of the Rings. And I think of all three is, as one movie um, because they were done that way, right? Like they didn't make the first one to see if it would be commercially successful and then make the second one. They did it, you know, as right. one project. Um, and we actually just finished last night watching um, all the way through Return of the King with our kids, which was really fun um, because we've seen those movies tons of times um and we quote them all the time and things like that or just around the house so it was kind of fun with the kids to watch those things and see them picking up on you know the different quotes uh that they're used to hearing from us and it, so it was super cool and just also talk about like different storytelling elements that are used there there was actually one thing um so how, have you seen those enough where if i'm referencing stuff it's familiar to you maybe i think i've only seen them all once okay parts well of... do you remember the kraken like uh 
you know, up on a mountainside that comes out of the water? No. Okay. I mean, yeah, no, yeah, sort so, of. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and just give you, uh, I'll, I'll try and explain it. But basically, so, you know, the whole fellowship of the ring is about to go uh, into, um, into a mountain and uh, through a secret dwarven door. And so they're getting there trying to figure out this riddle of how to get inside. And um, one of them disturbs the water. And all of a sudden, just as they manage to open this door, this giant tentacle, you know, whips out and uh, wraps itself, I think, around Frodo. Um, and so, you know, it's super scary. Um, and they manage to chop the tentacle off just before it drags them underwater. And then they go back toward the door. And then all of a sudden, like eight tentacles explode out with the Kraken. <laughs> Um, and moment, I thought it was a, sure. it was a really great way to explain, um, that storytelling device to my kids. I thought like, so I, you know, I, I do this all the time with them. I think they find it super annoying, but I'll just pause a movie and like explain like, <laughs> you know, the intent behind the, well, you it's know, like me with a rated cat goes again, so, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and thankfully they don't hate it too much, but you know, just kind of the idea of like, you start with that one tentacle and it's already like shit hitting the fan. And then, like, they solve that. And then all eight tentacles like eight come of out. And, frying pan into the fire, know, essentially. Right. Classic. And then, you know, and then a few minutes later, after I'd explained that, like, there was another thing where um, I think it was, you know, they're, they're inside of uh, the Mines of Moria now. And um, they get into this room where there was this old battle with a bunch of dead orcs and dwarves around and things like that. And there's this corpse sitting up on the edge of this well. Does this sound familiar to you? No? I'm gonna have to watch these again because that Ryan Mulaney dude wanted to come on and talk about them, but uh, feel As free to come movie? on that. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, anyway. but I was like, do we make them pick one or do you do all three? But anyway, what are you saying it's, about the corpse? It's one though? project. I yeah. think you can. I think you can call it one. But anyway, right. that's uh, just a big demand because we do watch these again before we get into them. So oh, that like, is a big demand. Right. We got to watch, and then it's yeah, and they're long, version, which I do want to do. Like, yeah, so, especially hearing. I want to hear more about the details that you're getting into. So definitely exactly. continue because uh, I think that's maybe I need that extra appreciation of those particular like, so things. So they get into this. So, so to set this up for you, like it's like. Gimli's family, the dwarf, uh, like his family's from here, right? Like he's got some sort of like royal connection and shit. Um, and so they get, he's all excited to show everybody his home. They get in there and everybody's been slaughtered and there's like dead dwarves and orcs everywhere. And they've been there for years. Um, just their bodies rotting. And they get into this kind of main central hall and there's a tomb there and there's clearly been a massive battle inside. And there's this guy holding like a pages of a book that he was journaling in and you see that like he basically died and like his you know the writing goes off the page um and so gandalf starts reading from the book and he starts reading about like this like huge loud drumming throughout the caverns that was coming for them and so as he's reading this Stop um one of the it. hobbits mary like accidentally bumps into this corpse and knocks its head off and it falls down the well hits a well bucket and knocks that down the well way into the caverns and like you're just like oh shit because it's super loud and you good. don't know what's in this place right and so everybody looks up and they're like what the fuck did you do and then the entire body with all its armor and its sword and stuff falls in after it way louder and then you start hearing the drumming coming so it's just like again, like another moment, like that Kraken moment right afterward, which just made for this great, great one set up and pay off. Yeah. like to my kids, like just yeah. I mean, so and honestly, like as I'm writing this new draft of my own script, I was like, where can I do that same type of thing to just kind of elevate what I'm working on? So I think well, Chris and I, we spoke in your episode that we just finished up, how we were crazy when we had kids like we have gi joe's buried in the philippines because when we killed them in a story we were playing out i think that's always been our major gripe with the lord of the Rings shit to speak for myself but i think chris as well is that yeah, you always know that the, the kraken's not going to really pull him into and kill him mm, okay whatever There's, yeah. i just yeah. never feel like the stakes are truly there because everyone's going to come out all right and then of course at the end near the end they will kill somebody off once in a while but yeah, I really just want the main characters yeah. off. Like, you know, Sean Bean died in that one, just like yeah. everything. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, Game of Thrones, That's, Sean Bean, been do it right up front with someone we really care about and give a yeah. shit about. Then I'm like, oh, man. Because it's kind of an ensemble. 
and you have that luxury but this is something you could blame token for honestly you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. Not, i mean something. i read the books back then and i remember there being just moments and i was just like what the fuck was he on <laughs> like uh the guy Dude. busting through the wall, Jim Slade style, and reading and just saying poetry <laughs> and shit. And just, uh, it's funny that we're talking about this. Like, Kool-Aid. This wasn't right. planned at all. Yeah, exactly. um, but because I thought we weren't going to talk about this because I told Jay I didn't have a favorite fucking movie. Right. Um, oh, I think we but uh, movie. so we're reading Lord of the Rings right now. And um, we are like, what, what we're doing with like a few nerdy family members of ours is we're doing this like Lord of the Rings Bible study. <laughs> where we're treating it like a fucking bible um and like we're like, like everyone has to pick a sc- so like every chapter we're approaching with like a theme and it's fucking crazy so like megan my wife had this idea um she, because she was listening to this one this podcast where they do it with harry potter i was gonna say you and, should do this on a podcast yeah right and sure. uh so anyway like you just pick a random theme right so we picked like endings for the sh- for chapter one um and like you read through it and you're like oh fuck it's called bag end Oh wait, weird. Bag end sounds like the word begin. Uh, you start beginning to see all endings. these signs. And, like, and it just starts going. It's like a room like, two three seven for the shining or whatever that shit is. Yeah, uh, man. And like it's crazy. <laughs> like when you start approaching it, like like pretending like it's a sacred text, mm. how easy it is to read into it whatever you want. And having oh, been like a former Christian who actually did Bible studies and stuff, I actually wanted to dig into though. that at some point on this. Yeah, as well, we can. Like, yeah. But like I used to do the same thing back then, right? Like I mean, like I used to read the Bible that way, and and you would like kind Mm -hmm. of read like trying to get answers on whatever the fuck is wrong in your life. Yeah, exactly. And and you always found the answer. Interesting, interesting. And And it's it's interesting. You're feeling that with just a work of fiction, let alone the pressure when everyone's telling you this is a true holy book. Of course, you're gonna buy in when you. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's so fascinating for me to be doing that that way, and it's really it's fun and nerdy and shit. But like, yeah, yeah, man, it's crazy. Well, I'm just so proud of your family of trading the Bible for fucking Lord of the Rings. (laughs) Yes. One of my early experiences um, starting to write like in prose form was in school in the Philippines. Um, I think I must have been a freshman in high school. And every I think it was every day or maybe it was once a week. The I think it was this was just the English teacher would write a quote on the blackboard. And we had to write a story based on that quote, whatever it was. Prompt. And most people, you know, would just do very like random stories and, you know, things about their life or what have you. But I just from day one made it a like fantasy story of this group sort of Lord of the Rings, like group of adventurers. And from there through the whole like class every week, it was the same group. And every prompt you applied to this. It was a, a, it awesome. became a serial, you know, and he mentioned Lord of the Rings to me and I kind of had a vague awareness of it. But that's what got me first to really like pay attention to it. Um, because it wasn't that big. I, I knew all that from from D and D and shit from role yeah. playing I mean, games. That's where I got it from. D and like Dragonlance and shit like that, right? Yeah, so dude, yeah, we tried to pitch Dragonlance to Hasbro. Rings. That fucking went I can't nowhere. Can't believe Dragonlance hasn't become like Seriously. a major... Dragonlance is messy. The rights I mean, I know are all just, fucked up. That's the problem. Yeah, they just had a big lawsuit about a another like group of books that were going to be written by this the same author as Heisa Wickman, I think it is. Um, but they um yeah they they are missing a big opportunity because i know people who aren't even like weren't role-playing gamers and stuff but just knew the books like had read the books and liked them and stuff you know like Dude, over 50 million copies of those books are sold in like a hundred and something languages yeah they were fun i mean i didn't i wasn't like a massive fan of them but i probably read i don't know four or five of them to me what it's a use? more dynamic so. version it's, it's more Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. got oh, a totally. lot of yeah, that's Star a Wars way motley is. crew of, you know, um, different races come together. So it's a lot of cool racial yeah. shit in it. Yeah. I mean, it's fucking it had a bit more edge of Lord of the Rings. It is crazy. We um, tried to pitch Hasbro and they were just like, man, the rights are a mess. And fucking uh, that Joe Mangianelli dude, you know what I'm talking about? Like that big muscle bound dude married to Vera or what's her name? That fucking Mexican chick. She's like 40, but hot. What's her name? The one from uh, Family. I don't watch Modern TV. Family. Modern, Modern Family. family. Sophia Vergara. Yes. The dude who's married to her was like in Magic Mike. He's like this muscle bound fucking okay. dude, okay. but he's a big D&D guy. And I think they do like a weekly game. Yeah, I'm vaguely familiar with that. Vin Diesel and all these right. motherfuckers in Hollywood. Um, Tom Morello and shit, right? From yes. Rage Against the Machine, the exactly. guitar. <laughs> Which would be a hilarious D&D group. The crazy. Yeah, Vince Vaughn. Vaughn and, and, hey. Yes, Vince Vaughn stops in. <laughs> Dude, but, did I uh, tell you that we're doing D&D with our kids right 
No. Are you? That's awesome. Yeah. I can't wait yeah, till my, Q's old enough. And I need Chris to fucking move back here just, so we can really it's, tag team. It's his really ass. hard with my daughter. She's seven. Um, it's it's super challenging. Like, yeah, he just turned my, seven. And... My dad is uh because like he did this with me when I was a kid, so he's like the DM. Um oh, nice. and like we're doing it over Zoom because of COVID. Mm-hmm. And it's That's awesome. It's not easy, but it's really fun, man. You should Sounds record this. I want to see yeah, this shit. <laughs> yeah, we should record that. That'll be the next episode of Hard Out. Totally. Chris nice. and I have talked a lot about doing one, but it's such a commitment and fuck, it's hard. Um, but I do miss it. I mean, do you have any, maybe because you're all with family or whatever, but do you ever have that whole weird, the performative nature of role playing games? You feel kind of weird and corny and shit. Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, That's a whole part but, of it, right? But I think like it's really easy. Yeah. Like with, so like it's my dad and my kids. So like yeah. I don't, I mean, whatever. Like, it's not um, supposed to be taken to, so seriously. And, I think you, like, okay. if you really want to dive, like, way into the role playing, you, ha- A, have to be with people who are all game for that. Yes. And then, B, have to have a certain comfort level with them, right? Like, so that's not an easy thing to find. I don't think I ever, well, that's not true, but I don't know. I never had, like, a really long running D&D game as an adult. Like, I've tried it a few times and, none of them have gone more than like it's just weird and then you got months. wives who are like what the fuck are you doing yeah. <laughs> like we did we yeah. did like when i was uh, in my early 20s and shit me and some friends and jay was part of some of them um that were pretty epic man i mean they were like game of thrones level type you know storytelling and stuff with lots of twists and turns and i mean when it's being guided by individuals again like as jay and i were just saying before in the other podcast about the characters driving the writing like it really is just about motivations of various actors so to speak not you know in, in the sense of being operatives in the story with their that they're driving the action I and mean, with this the like i used to usually be the dm so i had to keep up with just like you can do whatever the fuck you want in this world it's, it's not like a video game where there's like even if it's a sandbox it's still you know can't go past that mountain you know this is like you can do anything the fuck you want literally you know w- at least attempt anything you want i haven't done um, this shit in ages partly because partly because of that self awareness yeah. issue and how weird it is and like you said finding the right people and all that but i think it's one of those things this creative interplay this role playing that you can hit that rare we talked about the flow state in the episode of re-entry we did that weird group flow state of like a jam mm-hmm. band or a yeah, you're, yeah, team, like you said you're all basketball in basketball team that's just effortlessly and that moving is the harder ball. and harder to access yeah yeah that but that's even crazier when you hit a group flow state playing D mm-hmm. or everything's just mm-hmm. popping and motherfuckers are making savings throws and <laughs> yes. it's fun as hell dude <laughs> The roll it. of the dice is, I mean, we used to play in the Philippines. I remember specifically, I used to play sometimes just like we'd be just like roaming around the neighborhood playing a game, a role playing game with just one other or two other people without dice or anything. It would just oh, yeah. be like we're all rational people and we're like, yeah, OK, I had to try this. And it's sort of like, you know, Jay and I are doing this side show where we um, are put it, pitting alien races against each other with a couple other guests. Um, and that is all going to be determined by us just hashing out who's, you know, more like you used to do as kids when you talked about. Yeah, like, dude, you think alien could be predator? You know, that yeah, kind of just shit. Like, well, nice. so he has claws and this one has, you know, <laughs> like and where are they fighting and all this kind of shit uh, where you didn't even need the dice, but I will say the dice are fun as fuck. Like when you roll and you get that fucking 20 or yeah, something. Yeah, that's like, oh, shit. <laughs> the you dice are key, The random dude. element is great. You know, I know that uh, the dice are fun as fuck. Like, and this, this just sells it. That's when my seven-year-old's engaged. Like if yes. she can roll dice, she is psyched. Well, like, Chris sent me like, a set and Q got his hands on them. Like, holy shit. And they're nice. Like better than we ever had as kids. They're like heavy metal fucking nice. they got some weight to them and he got me this fucking dude i might have this thing right over here it's like a like a leather thing you throw them in and shit you know what i mean so they don't go off the table or whatever like it looks like tanning skins or you know what i'm saying that's awesome like a dice tray like a i guess tray, a yeah tray, I think. and uh man for like a week he was just rolling this fucking i'm gonna roll it t- i got a 19 and shit like, yeah, man. like <laughs> it definitely it, engages they them. love the dice like for sure like you know like she just she loses her train of thought very quickly when 
you know, my dad is trying to like explain mm-hmm. something that's going on or explain like, explaining a room, which by the way is wicked hard over Zoom. Where I'm finding like trying to like figure out the mapping of everything. Mm-hmm. That's a challenge. Do um, you have to map? Because we used to do that too. I remember when Chris yeah, was I, four years older. He was especially the for them. Like I have to draw out like a map so they can kind of have this visual because like he can't pass anything through. Graph you know? paper, so, old school graph paper. Yep. Yeah. yeah when so, i first got into it as a kid it. back in maryland you know near dc we you know it's probably like you know eight or ten years old somewhere in that range i remember that being one of the first things i fell in love with was drawing maps on graph paper dude <laughs> just oh, yeah. up with the... you know what it's, that reminds me of like I mean, one, of, video like game one memory that i really that. love with my dad when when i was a little kid uh on nes there was this game called Swords and Serpents. And that rings a like, vaguely familiar. And my dad had took out some graph paper because he just knew to do that. And it was just basically like a, a D&D game. You're fi- working through this like underground labyrinth. There's like 17 levels or something. And it's a maze. But it doesn't tell you to, you know, map it out or anything. Mm-hmm. He did he knew to do that right away. Nice. And so we were mapping it out from the very start and just dungeon crawls, man. Together. Dungeon it was crawls. awesome. It was a great yeah great time do you ever play those Which, Baldur's gate games on like ps2 when they first came out those are fun as shit no it's pure just i never had crawl. a ps2 um there was like this this long period of time where i didn't really have much for um video games at all like productive bastard <laughs> well yeah there well actually yeah right things. like so it's like you know you got the day job and stuff like that and if you actually want to write or anything video games really take away from that um so well, you know, now we have a Wii U because that's a fun way to spend time with the kids and stuff. Like, love my Super Smash and Mario Kart sessions with those guys. Um, that's a blast. But, like, you know, for stuff for me, like, as much as I think video games are amazing, like, I did get Zelda Breath of the Wild, which, and spent That's way like too- an open world sandbox Dude, Zelda game, Dude, it's amazing. Right? It's so that's good. Sick. But I, I wasted so many hours on that. And then, like, <laughs> I was so pissed, honestly, but also, like, really grateful my son was like, hey, can I play this? And I'm like, sure. I didn't realize that you can only have one running game on that mm. at any one time. And he erased my like 70 hours oh, that I put into it. it. And I was Ouch. just like, you so know I what? Beat that, was, senseless. that was good. That was really good that that happened. I'm so yeah, pissed right now, right. but that just... was great. Like, because mm-hmm. there's no way I'm repeating that. You know, it is right. done. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just cut they can't be a time suck. Man, our kid, Chris, just got him a switch for our fucking Christmas. What an uncle, right? Um, and already, I mean, he's already been video game addicted, but he's fucking good at it. And he jumps around the whole time he plays. So he's like getting a sick cardio workout. He's nice. playing Mario, like jumping. Dude, I think I saw time. a video of him doing that. It's amazing. Dude. So I'm kind of like, all right, he's getting hand-eye coordination. He's getting some problem solving. He's jumping around. What the fuck's the problem? I mean. Right. But, it's a career in and of itself nowadays with esports and true. just video game development. But the problem like, is, I'm all for the machines taking dude. over the li- yeah that is that's the, the problem that's all he wants well, to do so i want to get him honestly i think video games cool and they do a lot of good motor skills and tactile shit like that but what yeah. you're doing with the role playing with your kids engaging their imagination getting them to see things that are only described mm-hmm. through words that's really problem funny. solving yeah setting you up for the rest communication. of communication yes I'm, I'm setting them up for a life of hell as they try and become <laughs> artists screenwriters right no shit you better, yeah what like, are you doing it's child so, abuse you no my daughter wrote diagramming things. sentences with them you piece of shit <laughs> dude what are you my doing? daughter wrote like a 2100 word short yeah. story in december she's fucking Insane. seven like it's insane. Like I didn't have anything to do with it. She just told me, "Hey, my story's done." And I'm like, "She's written more than me lately." <laughs> no shit. That's crazy. <laughs> That's all. What's her story about? Uh, it's called the Life of Friends, and it's like kind of like awesome. a Secret Life of Pets ripoff. Um, uh, but uh, you know, it's it's awesome. Like it's so cool. You know, it's just uh, she's and and she really like turns a phrase pretty well. But they both read a lot, you know. So do you remember um, the first thing you ever wrote? Do I? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I remember. So I wrote um, in third grade. I put together this uh, book. It was definitely like a D&D inspired thing. Um, <laughs> in third grade, I put together something called the Wish Kids about these like two brothers who find these stones that come together and then they can just like wish for anything ma- or like any magic that they want. Right. Wishbringer, dude. Um, Remember that? And, oh, and yeah. like, so I, I wrote and illustrated the entire thing, submitted it to a contest. 
didn't do anything. But then two years later, I actually did win that contest. So with what? Uh, that was a Gary Paulson hatchet ripoff called uh, Grand Prizes Aren't Always That Grand. So nice. there you go. In fifth grade then, two years later? Yep. So That's awesome, I, man. I did actually, not. I don't think but, I even realized that writing was possible or a thing, even though I was way ahead of my reading level and all that shit as a kid. But I didn't write. Make them ups. We make comic books. That's what it there was. There you go. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's yeah, writing, and, dude. And again, just like, you know, playing with our toys and shit, we'd come up with all these storylines and stuff. Totally but it wasn't, it wasn't. But pros yeah, didn't fuck sure. with pros till college, maybe. Well, here's here's the funny thing. So uh, high school, I, I wrote a whole thing well, based on my waking. friends. I turned all my friends into it was a comedic sort of like Monty Python esque. Tenacious That's cool, though. Fucking bit. epic with turning all my friends in school into characters. In this That's fantasy awesome. shit. I don't know what happened to it. I got to figure out where that shit I is. I remember you had notebooks, like three ring yeah. grinders full of that shit, <laughs> handwritten with pictures and shit. It was amazing. Yeah, it was fucking bad. I wonder if mom movie. has that shit. Probably not. We probably lost it in Orlando soup kitchen. It's probably in Massachusetts yep. landfill somewhere. Go. Or an ex girlfriend's basement or something. Ah, true. Fuck yeah, me. I don't know. I think I actually still have um that like printout not of the wish kids but of grand prizes aren't always that grand i nice. think that is buried in a box somewhere in the basement do you ever that hear that like game a, wish bringer plus <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right um i don't know you're not as old as us but we're no, old 36. enough so our stepdad came into the picture i was probably like five or six six or seven i don't know somewhere around there but he was an it or a tech guy in the air force so yep. he had Commodore 64s, Vic 20s, all early computing shit, home computer stuff. And they used to have these games, these text only games. Do you remember any of those? There was one called Wishbringer. Oh, you know what? I remember made me one. think of your like the original Wish OGs. Kids. Yeah, we had a computer early because that was something that my parents, to their credit, like just real felt like was going to be a thing. And uh -huh. they had. I don't know about Wishbringer, but we had this one game that was like this outdoor survival game um, where it was text only, but like it would have you, you know, it, I think you were like a pilot that got stranded somewhere in the middle cool. and you had to like make all these it's decisions. And, yeah. So now nice. we know what? a mutual Facebook friend who does the click your poison books. Yeah. Games, yeah. Right? yeah. Choose your own adventure, right? Choose your own adventure. That's kind of what those are sort yeah. of, but it has totally. programming in it. So you can't, you know, uh -huh. same with the books. Sure. You can't choose the digital you know, version. It's a great yeah. point. Uh, your yeah. own adventure, but you're choosing whatever options they give you. But uh, have you thought about dabbling in that at all? Because that's, I feel like that could take off. But uh, dude, I don't have time to dabble in anything more than <laughs> right. I'm already dabbling. I dabble in parenthood. Right now? Fucking, like, right? I am so maxed out. <laughs> I'm so maxed out right now. The rest I'm but, committed to parenthood, dabbling. But dude, I always have been like that. That has like described my life has been dabbling. Like I mean, mm -hmm. I have been into so many things and gone hard into them for like two years but if you were a dc villain fighting batman you'd be the dabbler that'd be the dabbler i think it's a good name <laughs> ah, yes. terrible villain like the worst villain ever the dabbler uh, what would I my costume it. be like it Jack would just be this amalgamation just dabbling and crying shit. normally so, <laughs> what was that nate it would just, i said i said my uh, costume would be like this just amalgamation of all this random shit but the one <laughs> right. through line through all of the dabbling the which and there's and been a lot of it uh, the one through line ball. has been writing and then like i've been with my wife since we were 16 and that's that's it other than that like uh, it's pretty much everything in my life battle. changes every few years so how does she deal with that i don't know we both changed so much since then like i can't believe that we're still like happily together but somehow it's worked out um and it's awesome so real so. quick rattle off the other movies you would list beyond lord of the rings as your favorite all right movie. uh fight, fight club's high up there fight yeah, club's fight definitely club high up there um dude i don't know like i feel like i'm just gonna think of like i've never been one who's made like a list of that stuff you well, know here's so the thing though there's movies that are objectively the shit yeah fight club's the shit Mm -hmm. what are just some movies uh, that to like you that most that people just wouldn't it's pick. just going to be more recent i bet um so like whiplash is something that's been on my mind a lot lately i just i absolutely love that movie so much um uh let's see the departed 
is like that but that feels recent too and i guess that's not recent anymore is it that's okay um, somebody just posted that nick oh. clement dude that we did our goodfellas episode with he just posted today something about the first pirates of the caribbean movie came out like i love that movie years ago i love that movie oh that's pirates probably, of the caribbean like, movies are almost 20 fucking years old dude that's nuts if you made me like put together a top 25 guaranteed pirates of the caribbean would be in there i think that's one of the best adventure movies of all time to china so. get slayed have you showed that to your kids uh Yes, but I just asked them the other day, and neither of them remembers it. So it's going to happen in the next few weeks for sure. The so wife has been super one. protective with Q of what he watches. Like I said, I grew up watching. By the time I was his age, I had seen every Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Yeah, I know. You Friday tell me 13th, that. It's, like, it's fucking... hilarious to me. Um, we're like, it's weird. Like, I think I actually like this. So I, I'm less protective than my wife is, but but she's pretty loose about it as well i think you know like so like my son who's 10 has seen a few r movies at this point like stuff that i would consider to be more tame like i don't know terminator and stuff and we let him watch die hard around christmas this year and uh have you had to watch a movie with him yet where a female nipple makes an appearance uh yeah die hard oh my (laughs) god i forgot about that you know is there oh is there (laughs) yeah it's like really fast you know so I didn't say anything. Um, you know, just kind Do you of remember that when you were a kid, though, like 11 or something? That, that was weird with us watching yeah, those movies parents, where you're just like, like, like now maybe they'll like look looking, at their iPad or something for a second. But yeah, back then but, um, it was nothing. You just start petting the dog and shit with looking out the corner of your eye at some titties or something. Yeah, no, I told him uh, <laughs> it, it's an awkward thing, you know, and there'll be more of that to come, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I mean. What's what I think is cool, and again, like I think it, it, it's usually more her that, that pulls back on what, what they watch, but it's it, it has nothing to do with rating and more just like the content, right? So like we haven't let our son see the Dark Knight yet because like there are just so many yes. intense dark themes that, that go throughout that, and like I think I'd be okay with him seeing it at this point, but I absolutely respect that, like because like there's some fucked up characters in that movie. Oh you yeah, know? just so, philosophically, it's like very I totally. Just... You know, and that's, that's it's easy to see the appeal like, of the Joker, uh, Chris yeah. Butch, right? Mm-hmm. The famous story with our dad, Butch. Um, when we went to finally meet him, I mean, you've heard this story before, right? How our twin sisters found us because when he ran out on us, he went and made these twin daughters and then he ran out on them and they found us on Facebook and we went to meet him years it's later. It's years the later. that is the craziest story. I can't believe that's <laughs> a real story. It, we actually started or we were talking for a while about writing a script called finding butch that is basically I remember you saying the that. seth rogan version of this like what if this shit really happened but all the stories he told about being in the cia and a bounty hunter and all that shit were true and then we go to you know it just gets crazy like pineapple express or something Dude. but anyway when we went to meet him he had we watched django unchained with him which was fucking amazing <laughs> that's and awesome he had this back shitty room with like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dvds in it we're like that's fucking crazy that we could have had this thing we bonded over movies, but you skipped out. But you love movies. We're fucking making movies. Movies raised us. You know, Harrison Ford raised me. You didn't and shit. So, um, and we asked him though, like, wow, you have a lot of superhero movies. You don't seem like the kind of dude to be into spandex heroes and shit. And do you want to tell him, Chris, what he said? His fucking. Yeah, we, uh, we j- yeah, sorry, I had to let the cat out. He's <laughs> wants to get some sun. Um, but yeah, he we asked him what the appeal of all these superhero type movies were for him. And he said, well, take the Joker. You know, the Joker, he he wants to do bad, but he know it ain't right. You know, but like the whole thrust he was giving it, I don't remember exactly how he said it, but was that it was all the villains. He identified identified with with, right. The villains who, you know, struggled with their dark side, you know? So the problem I'm saying is showing your kid, the dark Knight. Yeah. I can see a kid seeing the logic and what the Joker's saying. And you know what I mean? Like when people get sort of radicalized by behaviors or ideas. But on the other hand, you could argue that maybe being exposed to it is a way to process it. You know, that's the fear. I, I know. Have. That's the catharsis of movies. And then we have conversations. Yep. That's why I started Rated Q with Q. It's like, let's literally sit down and talk about these movies. What was this movie about? What do you think it was trying to say to you? You know, and learn to 
understand the difference between fact and fiction and why we tell stories and how awesome. they impact us. And man, we fell away from it because I got so busy with Jack, but we're going to start kicking it off again soon. Dude, that, that series is great. And you should definitely it keep is. up with it. Um, yeah. So I watched, I watched Probably Whiplash the most successful with my son. Thing of anything we do. What's yeah, that? Whiplash. Whiplash is a great one to <laughs> yes. talk to your kid about. So I watched Whiplash with my son and that like, you know, as we're watching, I'm like, mm, man, this was like an edgy decision for sure. Right. Cause it's like, you know, um, I mean that character, uh, the the teacher. God, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. But uh, J.K. Simmons, bitch. Yeah, yes. dude. Well, first of all, like unbelievable actor, an unbelievable performance. I mean, he we he absolutely him slated. for Revenger uh, to play the lead but, role in Revenger. Well, but, Mechanicsville. Uh, when we rewrote oh, Mechanicsville, that's right. It was Mechanics the guys who optioned Mechanicsville. After we rewrote it, were some right, dudes right, who right. worked for him, and he was like our dream cast for the bad guy in it, Stamper. So J.K. Simmons is fucking yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but I mean, anyway, it was so it's just a couple. It was it created all these cool conversations with my son, right? And again, like as I said, I, I like would pause it after he'd drop an f bomb, but like the other f bomb, um, and like and be like, all right, so let's talk about this, you know, um, or you know, and and there were a lot of conversations about like talking about how like people are just people like they're not necessarily good or evil like they're driven yes. by different things and like so this guy like he's a giant asshole but also like you know it's coming from this place where he wants to achieve something great and help somebody else be somebody great and like two things can be true at the same time and so all those conversations were just i thought they were super cool to have you know we just talked about that with nurse ratchet in cuckoo's nest is she truly evil or is she think this is the best way to treat these fucking freaks right you know what i mean and these are the kind of films we should be watching with kids because when you watch only the pixar movies all you get is the same platitudinal themes almost every pixar time movies that, are so good they're though. good they're I love killer the pixar movies a good yeah. mix man that's you probably Soul, exactly what you need it's amazing but they're platitudinal and they kind of tell you the mm. shit you already even know right the kids even sure. know we need teamwork to get along we need to fucking you know face our fears all that kind of shit but these other these more grown-up movies like this to me is a soft launch into adulthood that you can watch a movie that deals with some of this more adult shit that's a and, cool way to put it jay i like that like a soft launch into adulthood yeah. that's that's so i'm actually, trying to explain it to my wife it's not working I think yet. that's cool <laughs> no i mean i i have no complaints like i mean just because like i'm, I'm slightly more loose than my wife would be i mean i really yeah. think um I think that we're pretty good partners in the whole thing, to mm -hmm, be honest. For sure. So. It's an interesting discussion, nonetheless, though, yeah. as far as... Have you like, ever checked you out... Want, the, oh, go ahead. You want them to uh, to sort of have this sugar-coated view of the world and then suddenly get plunged into... They go, they take the wrong turn on the internet or some kid at school, you know, exposes them to <laughs> something, you know, bad. Like, don't, you kind of want to prepare them or did... I know it's a, it's, that's the big question. Do you prolong that as long as you can or do you yeah i mean try and never been super yourself. protective like i don't know i just well, think of breakfast kids... club growing up bender was my fucking idol do you want bender to be your kid's idol probably not being bad feels pretty good don't it that kind of shit you know what i'm saying that's funny, but at the right, same time i right, do exactly. that's a massive struggle with me all my that's heroes are like scumbags and Bukowski's and Artie langs and shit and i'm like Am I going to just raise him to think Captain America is the guy? Fuck Captain America. He's boring as shit. You know what I mean? The guy does the right thing every time and shit. No, it's like, you got uh, to talk to your kids and like, and have that's, conversations. That's all it is. That's what and it create, is. You got to create opportunities for independence too. Like, um, and that, all that stuff is super important. Like, you know, like, I mean, thankfully we live, you know, and I will absolutely throw out there. This is a privileged thing, but like we live in an area where we're okay. Letting our kids walk to school when it's not fucking mm. COVID um you know we live a quarter mile from their school and although i think a lot of other people are uncomfortable with that type of thing we started letting them walk to school that's hard um, man you know when they were like eight and a half and six um and as soon as we did it we noticed all these other kids in the neighborhood had started walking to school too and i think that like people just need like there were other parents they who were like that. wanted to do that too mm -hmm. but it's scary because a, you're scared for your kids a little bit, right? But also, I think there's this fear of being fucking judged, right? Like, and mm, um, like being the bad parent. And concerned. ultimately, like, we let the importance of letting our kids have a little bit of independence win over that, you know? And like, 
No, it's counterintuitive like, though, because there are massive studies, and I've read so much shit that's like you gotta let your kids roam free. But I'm yeah, like, dude, a fucking thirteen year old girl just got shot and killed like a few blocks from my house. I'm in Milwaukee. Fuck that. When I'm back dude, in the burbs I mean, again, right, maybe. So like, but I don't think we do that. Like if we were living in an area that wasn't as safe as as it is here. I mean, right. you know, it's we're in this kind but of. But also, it's safer suburban. in numbers when all the parents yeah. let all their kids do it. The right. other kids are witnesses. Yep. If it's just your kids, yeah. then some West yep. Memphis three can shit can go down or whatever, you know? Well, I was going to say that that phenomenon that occurred naturally with your neighborhood could be something people do proactively. Like if right. you're right. in the position you were at the beginning that you're thinking about having your kid walk, what if you knock on all the neighbor's doors or if you have a Facebook group and say, mm-hmm. what if we start having our kids go there together as a group? That's an interesting idea. Well, just yeah, even left to play actually. to without supervision. That's key. And we grew that, up oh, too. Yeah. That's separate from that for sure. We send yeah. those kids, kids don't out even in the yard get all a chance the time. to Lord of the Fly shit anymore because there's always some parent well, hovering that's over. Thing, to... right? So I told you mm-hmm. how like my daughter wrote this story. And I, th- I think Q is probably the same way, right? I mean, you let Q play independently with creative shit all the time. Like I know he does his Legos and shit like that, uh-huh. right? Like, um, and like it's really important for kids to just like have like free play without like a lot of structure Sucks that he's our only child so he gets like lonely and bored I, with, dude i can't imagine only child during covid too fucking that's terrible i mean luckily uh, i'm basically uh, a fucking eight-year-old but that yeah helps. but uh that <laughs> but free what we play were talking stuff matters about- so much like they need that opportunity to just like make their own rules and, and yeah work out. out the hierarchy of who's the yeah. alpha who's the bully who's gonna run shit who's not like that's all natural stuff that we all come in like puppeteers trying to dictate yeah. and no one's the alpha it's like it's they know it's a fallacy because then they have those moments alone in school bathrooms or someone gets their ass kicked or whatever you know yeah know. like dude i'm so like it's funny you talk about that so like this this anti-bullying stuff right like on the one hand i'm so for it if it's achievable on the other hand i really doubt it is and that's coming from a place of like where I I was like the subject of extreme bullying as a kid. Like I was I was bullied like crazy. For what? Um, what's that? Why? Like what? What? So, what did I mean, they? What did they? Really hone small in on? town, rural, like um, town of three thousand mostly white people, um, almost all white. Like we had like one person of color in our school of two hundred people. And they still people. bullied you instead of him. Damn. I'm just right. kidding. <laughs> there you go. Um, but you know, like I was, I was the artsy kid and then we weren't townies. Mm. Um, like we, we moved in. Um, and like, I just did not fit in. With Nate this, worships with Satan. So, he plays D and D's fucking devil right. worshiper. All that stuff. Right. And like, in, <laughs> and like, you know, I mean, I, I was, I was a nerdy little kid, dude. Like, I mean, it just is what it is. Like that was the case. And I think I was, you know, probably really sensitive and stuff as well. And so mm-hmm. people just latched onto that. But the thing was that it was the school system of 200 people from, from kindergarten through sixth grade. Mm-hmm. So you'd never escaped your, your mm-hmm. spot in the pecking order ever. Like once that was established, that was that. And there was mm-hmm. no way mm-hmm. out. And it was that way all the way through um, ninth grade for me because I stayed in that town. And then I went to a different school and like my life changed in one day. Um, and it was it was so shocking how quickly it changed. Did you uh, make a decision like I'm going to go there and yeah, because I couldn't be a, do it. As a clean was, slate to be a new person. We got that in the military family. Kid. Every yeah, two yeah. years, we I, got to I, reinvent ourselves every two years. When I say bullied, like, I dude, I got like failing beat too, up like, in the locker like, rooms and slammed into lockers every single day and called faggot uh, every single day. And I'm sorry. Punk. Did you fight back like, much or you did know, you like physically fight back or all the time? I had 18 detentions in eighth grade for fighting. Um, like, and it didn't stop the people bullying you. It, like, no, I mean, you know, no. I won some fights and I lost some fights. I had my nose mm-hmm. broken in eighth grade, like, um, and like, what? You know, it, you know it's I all just, just bullies hurt people, hurt people. You know, dude, all those honestly, kids were like, cashing here's in at the home. Fucked up thing is, I I went to a reunion with those people when I was like, <sighs> that's interesting, twenty five or some shit. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. Write a short 20s. story about that shit. Yeah, and, that sounds familiar. I think someone mentioned like, that. They were almost all super cool. Like, you know, like everybody kind of like reached adulthood and like. They're not living under their oppressive parents and shit anymore. Yeah, so like, a lot of yeah. it. It was just, it was just really frustrating. Like part of me almost wanted them to suck, you know, like having mm-hmm. lived through that trauma yeah, yeah, and not yeah. seen them for Some 10 justice. years. And they were just like, they were cool people. And like, it's just kind of like, it was a yeah. weird thing. And, and to, to go through that trauma and then recognize that like, 
that's just what kids do, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so humans do. So, kids are just little humans. You know, in I would the love making, to think man. that like we can we can move past that, and maybe we can. Like I mean, the human race has certainly improved over several thousand years. Um, but I don't know, man. Like, the move is to all right. Well, you know the Gracies who created Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and shit. If yeah. you use the actual Gracie program, they have a kids program. And it's perfectly named. I think this is the key. It's bully proof. You got to bully proof your kids versus dictating to the world that we can't be bullies or whatever. Because it's just unrealistic. Like you mm-hmm. said, you got to make sure your kids are confident, know how to handle themselves, know how to report bullying to the right people, Dude, know how to advocate for themselves and choke that. a motherfucker out. But let mm-hmm. me tell you this. Well, right? That's so why like, I brought my that dad, up like. My dad literally, when I was a kid, I I shouldn't say this because I don't want to get well. Fuck it, he can't get in trouble. He's like almost, you know, he's older now. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, he, uh, like it. he like tried to like he literally like was like trying to like get me like to learn karate and shit like right. to protect myself. But they also like they would call like the dean and like the principal all the time and be like, "This is fucked up." Like nothing ever changed. Like yeah, you know, why would like, you they, in trouble for that? I mean, that's like, what should be done. I mean, it, it, I thought you were gonna changed. say packed a gun in your bag or some shit. Like, these kids fuck with you, dude. I, and you know what? It, I, it's I did hard. Bring a knife to school once, like you know, right, I never yeah. did anything with it. But like, well, I, mean, I was gonna. I was say, the reason kid. I asked earlier, and this kind of alludes to what Jay was saying about being able to, mm-hmm. um, you know, like if you need to shut that shit down. That that's why I ask that all the time about bullies because I've had a few, and I remember d- just unleashing on them to the point they just like stopped, like. I think I just fucking went nuts, you know, enough to just like, yeah, dude, I don't know. You're like, scared I, like, you cornered cornered that leverage thing. You gained a little leverage by showing you could be a crazed cornered animal that will fuck uh-huh. something up if they fuck with you too much, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, but I, I, I know, know that's not always going to be the case. I think it's just yeah. anecdotal, you know, that's yeah, why, yeah. but I'm super curious. I mean, it's, it's a mob mentality thing, right? Like, so the weird thing is like some of these kids who would, you know, gang up on me um, at school, I like I then like would invite me over to their house a few weeks later and yeah, we hang out yeah. like so, you yeah, know it's about just that too, that lot well to them it's normative out. though if they're catching that kind of shit at home and then they're externalizing right. that internal mm-hmm. shit to them so, it's just normal life know. and you know I, I don't like I mean dude I'm in my mid 30s now I don't hold that shit against anybody anymore yeah, like but it was certainly traumatizing and absolutely had an effect well, on who let I me ask today. you this because well, that's why we write what we write the type of Right. you know material we get into is based on the, those kinds of experiences go ahead jay well we wanted to touch on this religious awakening yeah, go or, for it, that's some uh, over the years too. but I, I wanted to know first off as someone who was raised in a christian home very christian i took i got the impression over the years well it, that's that, weird too but that, go ahead. did you forgive all of them do you think that christianity armed you to forgive these bullies better hmm well all right so here's because the forgiveness thing is usually for yourself it you forgive others for yourself not for them right so so here's my background as a christian um like we always went to church and shit like that when i was a kid um but at like 14 around that time just before just as like i was really i was like leaning way into like the punk rock and rebellious stuff i think just because like fuck you to everybody i was still in ninth grade so still at that other school Mm, angsty um super angsty um did you wear like jinkos and shit for a little while yeah and then i kind of went more to like the underground like like straight punk and hardcore scene Um, i remember seeing some videos you shot in high school like house basement Oh yeah, like, dude. Mo- I, like, mosh that was like my shit. first stuff was like directing <laughs> music videos and stuff. And I was in bands and stuff and as well. Like I said, I'm a, I was a dabbler. Um and so anyway, it's a great like, punk name, the dabbler. We always went to church yes, and then like I met some people who were like these punk rock street missionaries. Um uh, cuz I would I would kind of like hang out like um and you know, so I met some people like that and they invited me to this evangelical church except it was like a cool church um and that was like my introduction to real oh so it wasn't even your family no um my parents still twist, believe yeah. my, my parents are still christians but they're not like fundy mm-hmm. um so they think you were you know, kind of over the top with it for they, a minute? but here's the funny thing is like they started coming <laughs> to church with me a couple of years later Interesting. and then we all kind of got into that for a while and now and they, and so I got heavily into like that stuff. Um, and, and my wife was in that world too. And so like, and we met each, but she was like 
in that kind of like again like you know punk rock like this it's this weird space dude like um of like well, there's rebellious so many niches, inside yeah. of evangelical Christian christianity punk. and so she was already in that and that's how i met her it was through that and we actually like we were in like a band together and shit we used to like travel across the countries to go to these five day long camping christian hardcore metal punk festivals and it was, it was actually super fun it's like a documentary awesome. about that um, shit that dude, it, like that shit was a blast like i had a great time doing that um but like the world was fucked up like in a lot of ways like there were a lot of great things about it like a lot of the community aspects were really good but like there was it was very culty in some ways Mm -hmm. um and so like i was like heavily into that and like started like leading bible studies and stuff and like we were kind of into that until like our early to mid 20s and my wife actually left it first and I was really upset because, like, you know, somebody leaves behind Christianity. A picture like, young Nate, like, what are you doing? To yeah, her? when you really like, think I literally that thought, stuff, you think I, your soul was. I literally it, thought she was yes. going to hell. Like, right. I, I thought my wife Jeez. was going to hell. Like, the person I love most in the world is going to go to hell. Like, that was really, really traumatic, you know. Um, and but like, I followed behind her probably within a year or well, later. Um, I'm curious about the specific mechanics of what I wish we got into this like first. 10 minutes into this because, yeah, right. Yeah, we got, all right, so I gotta go quick, right? You gotta come yeah. back again, but all right, so I don't know how much time we have. I don't um, know, but so we had, no I'm gonna out of respect to our family, sure. um, you know, be a little vague here, but we had a, a, a really, really traumatic death in the family, oh. um, and um like that it just shook us to i think i know the one you mean but yeah yeah i'm sure you do um and it absolutely shook us to our core and so like we had been praying for this person for a very long time and so had like hundreds of other people and the bible is very clear and we believed every single word of this fucking text that like if you pray for something earnestly like god will give that to you and you know like we were like, well, maybe we didn't pray properly, but Mm -hmm. out of all these hundreds of people, somebody had to, and like, but this person died anyway. And they were very young. And um, so that was kind of like just a little shock to the system. And almost nobody from our church came out to the funeral after like we were heavily involved in this place. Mm -hmm. And so that was weird. And so Megan, my wife, just, she couldn't go and face them. So she didn't go back to church after that. And I went for like a year um without her which was really really weird that's awful like every time you come home for hell's yep. church <laughs> right but like at, like i'd Sinner. always enjoyed science and read a lot of stuff and somehow managed to make like the creation myths work with science like i you know there are books out there that hey there are really famous well. scientists who are religious as shit yeah know? um but i you know Doesn't make sense. at me. some point i don't remember what the trigger was i wish i did the doctrine of hell just fell away from me i was like this doesn't make any sense and like i had a bunch of friends who were gay but like i believed that homosexuality was a sin and that was like you know i was like this doesn't make any sense and it was just this house of cards that started falling away very quickly once i gave up a couple of things like because again everything had to be logic based it was like mm-hmm. well i can't believe in like you know dogmatically in this whole text and pick and choose like if if this yeah. doesn't if i don't believe this you have to take it all or nothing basically it's a, right, right it's all or nothing you can't like you're so lucky it invalidates too. anything you're so lucky that you had a dad who broke out the graph paper who right. graphed out a video right. game so, so totally logic good. was I, part of your dude i am subset so, like, because if i have anything, you found the evangelical shit late though i'm saying if you had yeah. been indoctrinated by your own family you're fucked i think so yeah um so hard like you see like that we megan ellis sure roper enough, i have great parents and i can't say enough about like what that has done to set me up for life like i mean like they're just really really good and smart and interesting people your parents sound amazing counsel sometimes they're like lot. damn i wish nate's parents were my parents they're, they're pretty yeah. awesome they'll probably be a banker or something uh, right yeah. well, <laughs> that's another uh, that that's another hard out episode um <laughs> but anyway so like I, the house of cards fell apart and it was just like i you know, and so for a while, I, I kind of believed in God, but I was I was like, it, it was very ethereal. And then I just became more and more agnostic and um, started, you know, leaning into science and, and skepticism a lot more. And there was this short period where I was very, very hard atheist and angry. And now I'm just kind of like, I mean, I don't really know what's out there, but I definitely don't believe in the Christian Judeo God. Yeah, this so. specific, like, <laughs> right. That, uh, that yeah. militant atheist shit might have been one of the things we bonded over. Because I don't know if you remember, I used to be yeah. way more yeah, militantly like, atheist. Yeah, dude, I've got a Dawkins book back on that shelf there. So, yeah. Um, well, I remember, though, Facebook, I'd be blasting that shit all the time. And then. I'm sure. 
Yeah, kind actually, of when I, our, I remember those sisters though found us. That. When those sisters found us, I'm like, all right, now we got a lot of family who's religious. And then yeah. uh, Q going to the gym. I'm like, all right, I'm meeting all these fighters who are super religious, but I respect the shit out of these guys. So I don't want to be offending all the time. And then listen, I like that whole the theory people... that we're in a computer simulation. I think that works well. <laughs> yeah, you got to see our episode with Doug. Uh, There's no free will, dude. So Doug Johnson. But militant atheist, that's such a misnomer, really, because you think of a militant anything else, militant, like religious. I actually have a t-shirt of that. <laughs> that's it's a like person militant running around Muslim. with AK-47. Funny, shit out there. Right. Right. Muslim, and then militant atheist is a guy like reading to his Richard kid, Dawkins. Carl Sagan book or some shit, right? Exactly, you know, just getting a little fucking, uh, you know. But it's not, a militant atheist. With their fucking argument. You know? Yeah, that's militant. what it is. A militant atheist is one who not dehumanizes, but definitely shits on and degrades yeah, looks down on the religious and i've come to the conclusion though you got to meet people where they're at we were all yes. programmed with this shit you can't yeah you just got fault to them like, arrive and, at go ahead chris well you had one of the best analogies ever you said i don't hate cancer patients i have a problem with cancer but it's you got to be careful to not insult cancer patients when you insult cancer that's what it is when you it talk shit scenario. about religion you know what i mean right. it's like i feel like there's somebody who's infected with this thing and i want to point out how i think that thing is a negative but i got to do it in a way that doesn't say they're a negative you know people's egos are run amok that's really the key to all this shit is ego you know pretty much everything the bullying you dealt with why we want to write like shit you talk about writing george orwell wrote that great essay why i write the number one reason was ego Mm -hmm. so ego's behind all this shit yeah i mean other than your basic needs you know like what other motivator is there the you know, pyramid of needs or what hierarchy of needs, Mar- Maslow, or whatever. Yeah. Maslow. <laughs> Maslow. Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't know. Does that, does that cover the Christianity stuff that you guys were curious about enough? Anything else on that or? No, I think that's pretty good. I mean, it's always just, I don't know how many people will watch this shit. Our audience is so small. We hope Cactus Jack will blow it up, but then who knows what kind of freaks will be our audience and shit. Right. But, uh, well, maybe a lot of them might be Christian. Um, the point is, don't take everything personally. When somebody takes exception to your religion, you don't have to defend it as a soldier would defend some ethos that he was born into. You know what I mean? Just, I don't know. And to the militant atheists out there as well. Like, totally. What's all, well, I, I brought up that Megan Ellis, Ellis Roper, Ellison Roper, whatever her name is. She was part of the God Hates Fags fucking family. She mm-hmm. defected from that family, but it happened through Twitter which is interesting as hell to me. She met her husband, who was this Twitter guy, but what he did was he practiced over months and months the Socratic method. He just kept asking her questions. Oh, that's interesting you think that. Why do you think that is? Well, but if you think this, isn't this kind of weird? You know, we go in so hard in the paint all the time on this shit. It's fucking yeah. stupid that you believe this. It's like, no, well, just ask, all you got to do is ask questions. I think that's one thing that we, revealed, you know? we line up really well on. It's like, we're really big on listening to people that we don't agree with. You know? Absolutely. And it's weird how many people get freaked out by that. Like they suddenly think that because I'm willing to listen to somebody, that means that I'm on their side, that's which is crazy be, to me. Like it's I'm not even close to there, you know, like not even close. I'm just I'm way to listen, more, you know, interested. Like, yeah. Like so, I'm way more well, interested in hearing that you've evolved a lot with than someone. So that you, I, yeah. Yeah. You can sure. understand. And like Chris says all the time, I know how I think. Well, that is exactly. the thing actually. Right. So like, I know how much, like my like the my entire like cognitive function has changed right <laughs> like like my entire worldview like so i know if that's mm-hmm. possible like i probably probably everything that i think right now is not entirely 100% correct i i know that that's true so i'm curious about things yeah and also i i believe that other people can change too because of that you know right mm-hmm. exactly. that's why we get yeah. in a shit with the, they who will not be named on facebook eventually over the years as far as people are irredeemable the deplorables and the deplorable best yeah, i don't believe know? that i don't Absolutely. believe that at all because I, I, I know doomed this if we believe if anything that. you need to like pr- promote the idea that it's the complete opposite because that's what we want to happen you know you want to encourage the idea that people can change their views without like the whole flip flip-flopping thing with candidates that people criticize like 
feel free to flip flop if it's because you arrived at the, a different conclusion based on thinking. Right. As it long as it doesn't seem like it's like for money or votes or anything. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. No problem with that at all. But the doing like, it, I, I would hope somebody you, would evolve in forty years. Jesus, like, right? You know, well, say what you want, like about Tulsi Gabbard. She's a fucking you know lightning rod. But like she said, we make peace with enemies, not with friends. Mm-hmm. That's huge. All these people who want to echo chamber each point. other and like, what? Well, like she shouldn't go talk to fucking Assad. No, yeah. you make peace with enemies. You have to talk to the people you don't agree with. That's the only way you get to this shit. And they want to just, I mean, what, I don't know what you think about Trump and this whole thing getting kicked off Twitter, but like parlor to me exists only because Facebook and Twitter wouldn't let people say crazy shit. So then and you how forced you... them into their echo chamber. And now you have an echo chamber because you forced all them into right. that one. And I I mean, when you're talking about ideas, what better way to process with them and deal with them than to use the same forum and let them be aired and, you know, totally picked apart and ridiculed. And some people just are never going to change because they're fucking amygdala is a certain. You're alone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it cool if I start filming now? No, when we get inside. Why are you here? I just thought it was really interesting, you know, that someone hasn't left their basement in six months, not even to use the bathroom. Is that true? Why would I want to go out there? I got everything I need right here. That's what's wrong with most people. They're weak-willed pussies and parasites. You buy into that whole, it takes a village bullshit. You know how many aliases I've used calling into radio shows? I've had it up to my goddamn gills with the systematic feminization of this country. Army of course we want to. Get your own damn show if you think you've got that much to say. Yeah. You live in your mom's basement. I get down! Fuck you! What's so special about my loser son? You really do hate your own mother. She's a woman. Why wouldn't I? You know, there's some disconnect there, and, and if I could find it, what is hate? Where does it come from? Where does it go? You want to know what gender you are? Reach down the front of your fucking pants and shoot fucking kite. Black lives matter. Do you call horses slaves? Liberal fucktard. Enough with the parades and the rainbow flags. Dude, this guy's, it's like pure hate, man. I want to see something really fucking cool. This guy is a fucking animal. He's got himself on a leash. He's itching to get off that fucking leash. And he's gonna fucking kill some people. What a fucking show. No, stop, man, stop! What are we here? Look at me! Look at me! We're gonna help you show him the light. We're gonna change the world. This is Cactus Jack coming to you live from a studio audience. To the man who calls himself Cactus Jack. We have watched as you have rocketed to infamy. And you wonder why these cornered animals lash out. Get the fucking side. And now, we have watched as you have called for literal blood. I know you're out there listening. It's buzzing in your ears, burrowing into your brain. Do it, Jack. You're gonna love this. I pulled that trigger on that motherfucker's head. Your VPN will not shield you. The dark net will not hide you. You and your kind are finished. You think I'm scared of you? Come and fucking get me! Might I be your neighbor? Neighbor?